So now for the capacitor switching, we're going to take a look at a worked example. And I'm assuming that I'm in a substation where I have a transformation of 100 kV to 12.47 kV. Uh, it's not important what the high side voltage is because the capacitor is on the 12.47 kV side. So we're assuming that the capacitor is at the top of the feeder, um, basically at the 12.47 kV level. And let's assume we have a net impedance of 7%, that's 0 0.07 per unit. And we'll start with the resistance equal to zero, and then later on we'll have an X to R ratio of six, and we'll see what the difference is. And the MVA base, which in this case would be the rating of the transformer, is 20 MVA. So if I switch on a five megabar capacitor on the 12.47 kV side, I want to calculate the transit and just so I have an initial value of voltage in here, I'm going to assume I have an initial value of voltage of 1,000 volts. So this could actually range in practice from plus or minus. Um, the peak value of the voltage that that source could actually provide. And so let's figure out how we can calculate the voltage in this case. And I'll give you this in a PDF file um, so you don't have to copy all this down. So anyway, at the top is a schematic of this particular circuit. Um, basically, it just kind of shows what this would look like. Uh, it's Y grounded on the secondary side. So this capacitor bank would be three capacitors connected in the Y grounded configuration. And we're just focusing on calculating one phase in this case. Uh, and anyway, this just kind of shows a schematic of what we're trying to solve. It's just a kind of a drawing corresponding to the problem statement. So the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the inductance and capacitance. And so to get that value of inductance associated with that source, assuming all the resistance is negligible, then the transformer um, inductance that would be calculated from X. X is going to be 0 0.07 per unit. And then Z base to convert that into ohms, this is going to be V squared divided by S base, which is 12.47 squared divided by 20. So the 10 to the third squared in the numerator cancels out with the 10 to the sixth in the denominator. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to take that value of X times Z base, and we're going to divide that by the frequency in radians per second, which is 377. All right. So what this is going to do is this is going to give us the inductance in, in millihenries, 1.44 millihenries. You see what we need to do for this transit analysis is we're not working in terms of phasers and values of reactants and uh, impedance. We actually have to get the actual values of L and C. So now to get the equivalent capacitance for this capacitor, we know it's five megabars, that's a three phase value. What we need to do is we need to take V squared over X and use that to calculate what X is, and from that we can get C. So if the reactance is one over omega C, then basically five megabars is gonna be the line voltage squared divided by one over omega C, and I could use this for solving for C. C is gonna be Q divided by V squared times omega, um, it's a three-phase value of, of capacitive uh, bars. It's a line-to-line -line value for voltage. And this is going to give us 85.2 microfarads. So just keep in mind that a microfarad is 10 to the minus 6 farads. So once I've got these values, then I can start solving the circuit problem. And what I'm going to do is just go ahead and assume that I'm, I'm using uh, a constant uh, voltage equivalent model. So I'm going to ignore the 60 hertz component and just go ahead and assume the source can be modeled as a, as a DC source. Now in this case, I, I say I want to switch uh, at negative uh, of the peak, right? And so if I had a, a, a forcing function for the circuit, 12.47 kV, that's 12,470 volts, divide by square root of 3 to get a line to neutral value. 
multiply by square root of 2 to get a 0 to peak value. And let's suppose it had a sine form, uh, sine omega t plus theta, where theta is the point and wave. Well, for t equals 0 switching, what I would want uh, to correspond to negative of the, the source peak voltage is I would have a point of wave where theta is equal to minus 90. So what this means is I'm actually switching on when I have um, minus 10,182 volts. And so I just simply represent the source by that DC value. I have a value for reactants. I have a value for capacitance. And then what I need to do is I would need to solve the differential equations and use the boundary conditions associated with this particular circuit. And the boundary conditions are going to be that the initial capacitor voltage is 1,000 volts. If I initially have no load in the circuit, then before that switching occurs, there's zero current going to the inductor. So another boundary condition is that I've got zero current at the time of the switching. All right, so 1,000 volts across the capacitor, zero amps going through the inductor. So I'm going to go ahead and just write the differential equation out, but what I'm going to do a little bit differently this time than what I did in the lecture is I'm going to just go ahead and solve directly for voltage. And so you guys can see what the difference is going to be in the calculations. And so basically in this case, I've just got the inductor and capacitor. So if I write a Kirchhoff voltage law relationship, voltage across the inductor plus voltage across the capacitor is equal to the source voltage. And what I'm going to do to get everything in terms of voltage, I'm going to make use of the fact that since the inductor or capacitor are in series, that the current going through both elements is C dV dt for the capacitor. I can make this substitution for L right here. I can make that substitution. And so when I make this substitution then, um, solve, I'm going to get this in terms of a second order differential equation. I'll have LC times the second derivative of voltage plus VC is equal to VS. All this is going to be simplified if I divide both sides by LC. And then um, what this will give me for the final form is it'll give me the second derivative of voltage plus 1 over LC times um, VC is going to be equal to 1 over LC times the source voltage at the time of the switching. And we basically said that it's going to be minus 10,182, but it could be other values of voltage. The source, the capacitor voltage is going to be the combination of the steady state voltage and the transient voltage. And before when I calculated the current and I had a um, steady state solution, the current and steady state is going to be zero. But that's not going to be the case for voltage because what's going to happen is the capacitor would eventually look like an open circuit. The, the inductor would look like a short circuit. So in steady state, the capacitor voltage is going, to, is going to charge up to the source voltage. So in this case, I'm assuming that steady state voltage is a constant. I need to find out what that constant is. If I take this equation that I just derived and I substitute in there for the steady state voltage, knowing it's going to be a constant, the second derivative of a constant goes to zero. And what I see is that the steady state voltage is just going to be equal to the source voltage. So basically, the capacitor voltage charges up to the source voltage. Now that I have the steady state part, I can focus on the transit part. Uh, I write out the characteristic equation if I just simply have an LC circuit. That's S squared plus 1 over LC is equal to 0. I could solve for the roots, and the roots are plus or minus J omega naught, where omega naught is the natural frequency of oscillation, which turns out to be 2,855 radians per second. Now what I can do is I can put both the steady state and the transit solution together. So here's the steady state part. The transit part is going to be the form of A1 cosine of this natural frequency times T plus A2 times sine of this natural frequency times T. So anyway, this is going to be the form of the transit part. It's going to oscillate at a high frequency. And then I 
apply the boundary conditions. So set VC at time zero equal to a thousand volts. I could then solve for A1. So A1 is 11,182. Take the derivative of the volts with respect to time. Uh, we basically said that current is zero. And so since D, VDT at time zero is equal to zero, I can make this substitution in here. And taking the derivative of each term, sorry about that, taking the, the derivative of each term, ah, hold on a second. So taking the derivative of each term, then the constant evaluates to zero. Uh, basically, that cosine turns into a sine, so when I substitute into time equals zero, that disappears. And then the sine term, that's going to give me omega times a, a cosine. And so this is where this kicks out this omega times A2. Um, and what we see from this case right here, that this A2 term, that's just simply going to be equal to zero. And so um, what I can do then is then, then I have the form for the solution in terms of A1 being 11,182, A2 is equal to zero. And then I could finally substitute into this final form for VC. And what we basically see, there's a constant part and there's uh, a sinusoidal um, high frequency term. So you can see that, you know, when we talked about this in class, it matches up with what we had in class. Basically, what this voltage is, it's of the form of the voltage we have at the time of switching minus the voltage we have across the switch at time zero times cosine of omega naught t. And if we want to find out what the peak value is, well, the peak value is going to occur when this second term right here, this cosine term, is going to be minus one. And it's going to, the cosine of this term is going to be minus one when omega naught t is equal to pi. And so when we add these two terms together, we see that this peak value of voltage is minus 21,364. This isn't the worst case. Um, the worst case would be when we have three times the source voltage. It'd be about 30,000, um, but it's still obviously pretty high. It would put a lot of stress on the circuit. Now, if we have damping, then this is going to change a little bit. And what I mean by damping is we have some resistance in the circuit. And so let's assume that the ratio of x to r is equal to 6. Let's just assume that x stays the same in this particular case to make this simpler. And that means the resistance is just going to be 6 times less than that reactance. It's going to be 0 0.091. Now, one caveat about this, one thing I want you guys to watch out for, is if a lot of times in the problem statement, I would tell you that this is Z and the X to R ratio is this, all right? If that's the case, if I had told you that Z is 7% and then X to R is equal to six, you have to go through a few more steps. You get the magnitude of Z now before you got X, but now that's gonna be Z. And then you have to calculate R and X using the fact that the magnitude of that impedance is the square root of r squared plus x squared. So the pot 0.5443 would be the square root of r squared plus x squared. x is 6 times r. You can calculate r, and then r is actually 0 0.0895, which is a little bit different. And then x would turn out to be 0.5368. And so be, play close attention to the, the problem statement. A lot of times I'll give you a magnitude of the impedance, I'll give you an X to R, but in this particular problem statement, I just said that X was this. And so it's a, just a little bit different. It doesn't make a huge amount of difference in the numbers, but it's slightly different. So anyway, now this is what we have for the equivalent circuit. The equivalent circuit has a resistance in it. So I'm gonna rewrite out the differential equation, you redo the Kirchhoff voltage law relationship, and what gets added now is we add the voltage drop across the resistor. It's the only thing that changes. So you kind of go through the same thing you did before, 
remake the substitution that basically the current is C D V D T. Okay, you do the same thing, get everything in terms of voltage, divide both sides of the equality by L C, and you get this particular form where the difference now is we have this first derivative with a coefficient. So again, the voltage is a combination of the steady state voltage plus the transit voltage. Again, if we assume that it's going to be a, a constant form, because I have a constant forcing function, I can substitute into that equation. Again, I get the same thing I did before. We're in steady state. The steady state voltage for the capacitor simply matches up with the source voltage, the DC value at the time of switching. Now I have a more complicated characteristic equation to solve. Um, S squared plus R over L times S plus 1 over LC is equal to 0. Uh, and say A is 1. The B coefficient for the quadratic equation is R over L. The C term is 1 over LC. And so when I make the substitution, I could apply the quadratic equation. And I get that the roots are minus 31.6 plus or minus j, 2855. So basically, when you look at the ringing frequency, it's about the same as what I had before. The resistance detunes it a little bit, but not too much. So basically, that omega-1 that I had in the notes is pretty close to omega naught. But what the solution now becomes is a constant value and not only do you have the sinusoidal portion but also now what you have added is you have this exponential term and what this exponential term is going to do it's basically going to cause the sinusoidal high frequency component to decay out with time so it's going to basically drop away it's not going to stay there forever so we apply the boundary conditions like we did before we basically get the same value for A1. What's different in this case is when you calculate the derivative of voltage with respect to time, because you have an exponential, which is a function of time, multiplied by the sine, cosine terms, which are a function of times, so you have to apply the chain rule. So you start out by taking the derivative of the exponential. This kicks out a minus 31.6. You set that time equal to zero. The second um, time you apply the chain rule, then, or, or to the second part of the chain rule, I should say, you have e to the zero. You're taking the derivative of the term of brackets. So you're going to have uh, minus a1, uh, 2855 times sine. Eva that evaluates to zero. The term that's important and it comes from here where you have the uh, sine derivative. So that's going to give me 2,855, and it's going to be a cosine now. Evaluate the cosine at time equals 0. This gives me 1. And so anyway, what you'll find out is you will have a term now for A2, which we didn't have before, which is actually pretty small. It's just like 124 in this case, if I, if I did the calculation right. And now we see that we have it a result that's pretty close to before. The only difference is now this sinusoid decays out exponentially and then there's another decaying term which is phase shifted by nine degrees that has kind of a small coefficient to it. It doesn't really change the end result that much. So overall basically what you're going to get is you're going to get probably roughly about the same peak value. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change a little bit because when time omega naught t is equal to pi, this exponential is going to damp out a little bit, so the peak's not going to be quite as high. And then this term is there. It doesn't really add too much. So what you'll actually see in this case is that the peak values just attenuate a little bit, but maybe not too much depending on what the ringing frequency is but for sh certain it'll actually it, it'll actually decay out at least with time now so what the resistance does is it, is it basically kind of helps as far as power quality and then it kind of gets rid of that um, high frequency ringing
All right, so I'll show what I'll show you what this looks like in PSCAD next.